So in this and two videos that follow, I'm going to go into some excruciating details about electronic configurations. To explain, an electron configuration is a list of all the electrons in an atom and the orbitals they occupy. To determine an element's electron configuration, we have to begin by breaking up the periodic table like this. As I've said earlier, this is the S block, this is the F block, this is the D block, and this is the P block. We then have to remember that the first box in the S block, this one right here, hydrogen, is 1S, and the first box in the P block over here, boron, is 2P. Let's put our thus far knowledge to the test by answering this question, what is the electronic configuration of oxygen? So to answer this, we first of all have to find oxygen on the periodic table. You'll notice that it's located right over here in box eight. We then have to count from left to right, starting at the top and working our way down one row at a time on the periodic table, remembering that each box represents one electron. We do that, of course, starting at hydrogen over here and moving forward until we get to our target goal, oxygen. So as I said, let's start with row 1s, the hydrogen box right here and count left to right. We're at the 1s row, so we have 1s box one, and box two. Thus far then, we've counted two electrons on row one, which is the 1s row. So we would say that thus far, our electron configuration is 1s2, because we've counted two boxes in the 1s row. This represents, of course, two electrons in a 1s orbital. But obviously, we're not to oxygen yet. We have to keep going with the next element in our count, of course, being box three, lithium. So we'll start right here at box three, the lithium box, and this is the 2s row. So we'll then continue going here. So we're at the 2s row, we go here, 2s, 1, and then 2. So because we filled up this row with two electrons, we can now say that the electron configuration that we've made so far is 1s, 2 for this first row, and then 2s, 2 for the second row. Now, obviously, we are not yet to oxygen, so we have to keep counting, but now the next element after beryllium here is over here at boron, it's box five. So this is the first box of the P block. This is of course on row two, so this is the 2P. So we then continue counting until we get to oxygen. We're here at 2P and we go one, two, three, and then four, and now we're at oxygen. So we've just filled up four boxes in our 2P block to get to oxygen. We say then that oxygen's full electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4. Does that make sense? Good. Now you should notice that if you add up the superscripts in the numbers here, so I've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, so if I add 2 plus 2 plus 4, I'll get to 8, which happens to be the atomic number and the total number of electrons in an oxygen atom. Okay, now I have to teach you something slightly weird. Going from left to right, I of course start here at the 1s row, and I got a beautiful 1s. And then I move down to the 2s row, and I got a 2s, and then I kind of fill up the 2s, 1, 2, and then I go to the next element over here, which is a beautiful, nice, neat 2p, and then I go 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then the next element is here in row 3, which is a 3s, and then I go 3s, 1, 2, and then I go to 3p, straightforward, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but then I get to row 4. Now, row four, something kind of weird will happen shortly. At row four, I, of course, start, as I would predict, with 4s at element 19, which is potassium right here. You'll notice, however, that as I move here to the right, going from potassium to calcium number 20, over here to scandium, which is number 21, scandium is in the D block. Now, here's the weird. Even though the first D block element, scandium number 21, is in row four, the D block actually reverts backwards by one number. So starting in row four, element 21, the first row in the D block is actually a 3D, not a 4D as we would predict based on the row it's on. Then of course we work our way through the D block, 3D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and then we hit the P block again and the P block reverts backwards to 4P. So the P block and S block follow the rows they're on exactly as you predict, but the D block reverts backwards by one number relative to the row that's on. Weird? Yes. Do you have to know it? Absolutely. Now, disappointingly, something similar also happens with the F block. So as we go, go across row six, starting at cesium, element 55, you go from cesium 
to barium, which is 56. The next element on the periodic table is actually lanthanum, which is number 57. This is the first element in the F block. Now, please note that even though the F block is on row 6 or starts at row 6, the F block actually reverts backwards by two numbers. So starting at row 6, element 57, the first element in the F block, actually starts with a 4F, not a 6F. Disappointing? Yeah. Weird? Yes. Do you have to know it? Absolutely. So please remember then that the D block is actually one row smaller than the row it corresponds with on the periodic table and the F block is two. Now, at this stage, you might be asking yourself, so now that I know how to assign an element's electron configuration, what in the world does that actually tell me? Well, do you remember all that stuff I taught you in earlier videos about quantum numbers and atomic orbitals? Well, this stuff, this electron configuration stuff, all goes hand in hand. You see, every single part of an element's electron configuration tells you something about its quantum numbers and orbitals. For example, if I've got a 1s2 electron configuration, this red colored one actually represents the principal quantum number or energy level or n number for these electrons. In this case, n equals one. So the electrons here in this s shell are at an energy or n number level of one their principal quantum number. Now in contrast, this blue colored S here is of course what kind of orbital these two electrons are in. In this case, they're in an S orbital, which of course corresponds to an azimuthal number or L number of zero. Now this green color two of course represents how many electrons, in this case two, are actually in this S orbital or orbital in question. So all of these components of an electron configuration actually can be used to tell us something about those electrons' quantum numbers. Well, that said, let's return to oxygen, which of course has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. I want to show you a little bit deeper now what each of these things means. Here's the oxygen's tiny nucleus where it keeps its neutrons and protons. Now, outside or surrounding that atom's nucleus, you should understand that there is a spherically shaped 1s orbital right here. And it, of course, contains two electrons. That is a 1s2. Now, outside of that 1s orbital is a larger, also spherically shaped 2s orbital like this. So that 1s is kind of buried inside it. And this also contains two electrons. So at this point, I would say 2s2 to indicate this orbital and the two electrons that are in it. Now, kind of a little bit outside of that 2s orbital and straddling the nucleus, there are three individual dumbbell-shaped 2p orbitals. One is along the x-axis, one along the y, and one along the z-axis like this. This is the 2p shell. Now, you'll notice that the last part of oxygen's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, says 2p4. Now, this means that there are four electrons occupying oxygen's three 2p orbitals. So where do those four electrons go? Well, they fill up these orbitals one at a time. In other words, electrons won't pair up to occupy the same orbital until there's no other option left. This is called Hun's rule, which I'll discuss in greater detail later on. Nevertheless, here are my three 2p orbitals, one along the x, one along the y, and one along the z-axis. For oxygen, I have four electrons in those three 2p orbitals because this latter part of its electron configuration is 2p4. So I'll put one of those electrons along this px orbital, another one here in the py orbital, and another one here in the pz orbital. Now each of these dumbbells represents one orbital. So this electron right here in the pz, for example, is actually, once it's in there, is going back and forth across this entire orbital, both lobes. Now, of course, that's three electrons, but I have to put a fourth down because I have 2p4 for an oxygen atom. So where do I put that fourth electron? Well, it has to go into one of those three lobed orbitals, and I'll go ahead and put it down right here in the X one. So here in the PX, I have two electrons. In the PY, I have just one going back and forth, and in the PZ, I have just one. Those four electrons combined represent our four electrons in our 2P shell, which is why I have a 2P4 component of my electron configuration for oxygen at the end. I should point out that the two paired electrons in the 2p orbital along the x-axis right here, so these two electrons in here, are actually different from each other because one of them has a plus one-half spin and the other has a minus one-half spin. 
So when we talk about an oxygen having an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, this is what we're talking about. We're saying that in oxygen's 1s orbital, there are two paired electrons. In its 2s orbital, which is a little bit further out, there are two more paired electrons. And in its three 2p orbitals, there are four total electrons, two of which are unpaired and two of which are paired. Now, I can't show it here because I don't own the copyright for it, but I encourage you to check out this HTML. This will take you to a really cool YouTube video that shows you in an animated way how all those orbitals cluster around the atom's nucleus. And of course, in some videos that fall, I'll show you more concepts and eventually some awesome worked out questions on this subject.